So I'm going to go quickly um, over meta-analysis and more specifically with more emphasis on risk of bias. And really the focus of this is on uh, how do we evaluate or find evidence that we can trust. So where are we, what are we going to cover here? Um, first, I'm going to talk just a minute about meta-analysis, what it's good for, and how far you can trust it. Then I'm going to go over assessing risk of bias in uh, scientific articles. So now, to, no doubt, you've run across uh, meta-analyses in your reading, and here you see um, a pretty standard forest plot. And, but the thing is, if you're somebody like a cl clinician, you might be thinking, well, okay, I see this cool graph and all, but how on earth could you use something like that to help your patients? Well, it's not a bad question. You know, it's a, so what? Well, I'm going to answer the so what question with two answers. And first, you need to be able to understand what a meta-analysis is telling you to determine whether or not it's going to mean anything for your patients or if you're a policymaker for the, the policy question you have at hand. Second, I want to emphasize that this is a tool that you can actually use in clinic or that you can use to direct um, policy. So, and I'm not making that last one up. You can do this. Now, rather than just you know, tell you about this. It might make more sense if I show you. I'll give you an example. Let's start with a scenario. So here's the problem. Pharmacological treatments for serious mental illnesses, or SMIs, commonly lead to weight gain, thus increasing your risk for comorbidities and non-adherence. I mean, if I'm taking these meds and they're blowing me up like a balloon and I don't want to gain weight, then obviously I may not want to keep taking my meds. So the question is, in patients being treated for serious mental illnesses, do lifestyle weight loss treatments you know, that include both nutritional and physical activity components, do they lead to better weight status outcomes than treatment as usual, which is, well, frankly, not much of anything? Well, okay, let's say we did our literature search and identified 13 studies that compared multi-component weight management programs for people with serious mental illnesses to standard care, that is, no weight management program. So we take change in BMI as our primary outcome of interest, and we extracted all the data and found that only two of the studies found a statistically significant greater improvement in BMI for the multi-component weight management program than standard care. Well now, okay, imagine that you were in charge of making the decision of whether or not to go to all the work and expense of instituting a program of this sort at your clinic. What would you decide? Well, we would probably say, no, you wouldn't want to do that. I mean, out of 13 studies, only two were statistically significant. So no, we wouldn't spend that time and money. But, and that would seem on the face of it to be the right decision. However, it's actually the wrong decision. And let me show you why. So let's say rather than just, you know, vote count, how many studies were significant, statistically significant, we did a meta-analysis which takes the data from all of the different studies and combines it. So in a sense, it creates a much larger data set. Well, I want you to notice some things here. These are the only two studies that found statistically significant differences between the treatment, you know, the weight loss program, and the comparator. However, when we combine the non-significant findings across many studies, we create a much more powerful picture of what's going on. Indeed, what we see that across studies, the lifestyle intervention re resulted in an average of about two BMI points lower than standard care. All right, and you might be asking, two BMI points? What's the you know what's the clinical significance? Well, here. Had we focused only on the number of significant articles, 2 out of 13, we might conclude that it really wasn't worth doing anything different than what we were currently doing with these patients. However, because we were able to combine the data from many small studies, we were able to get a clearer picture of what the true difference really is. And you might be thinking, well, I mean, it's two points, dude. Is that, does that make a difference? Well, for a six-foot male like me, that translates into about 20 pounds. And so, yeah, 
a 20 pound difference is a difference that makes a difference. Now, I'm hoping that at least some of you who are watching this are going to be like, wow, okay, you know, the, the light bulb went on, this is very cool stuff, and for the rest of you, you know, um, you could go watch a different video or something like that. But even though meta-analyses can be powerful clinical and policy tools, here's the hard reality. The numbers are only as reliable as the research that went into them. So basically, if you've got junk coming in, you've got junk coming out. Can we trust those numbers? In other words, lumping together a bunch of unreliable data is only going to, you know, produce more unreliable data. But how can we tell how reliable a particular research article is? Well, to do this, we need to evaluate an article's risk of bias. And so that's what we're going to talk about next, evaluating the risk of bias. Now, there are different levels of evaluation. Okay, evaluating the degree to which evidence is trustworthy really isn't a single step. Okay, so what have we got? Well, we first we want to look at internal validity, and that is we're going to do that by looking at or evaluating an article relative to particular risk of bias questions, risk of bias domains. Then there's external validity. Okay. And this is the overall confidence we can have in the conclusions, you know, after looking across articles. Then we get into issues of practice utility. Okay, what is the strength of a recommendation or an evidence recommendation to guide practice decisions? And this may take into account much more than simply, you know, does a treatment work? How much does it cost? What are the risks? What are the relative um, costs and benefits uh, of other com uh, similar or comparative treatments? So all of those things go into this, but right here we're going to focus on internal validity. Okay, and so I'm going to talk about risk of bias questions and risk of bias domains. Now, I want to clear up a misconception about quality versus risk of bias. Article quality is not the same thing as risk of bias, and people often confuse this notion of an article's quality. Is it a good or useful article? You know, good or useful for what? And they confuse that with risk of bias. The notion of quality is more of a global subjective assessment that doesn't really tell you what particular aspects of the study pose threats to the confidence that we can have in whether the findings of the study can be trusted. And we want to avoid mushy subjective assessments. Risk of bias assessments are much more specific. That is, they focus on discrete characteristics of the study. And for this, they have much clearer criteria than, well, was it a useful or was it a good study or did you like it? So when evaluating a study for systematic review and meta-analysis, we want to focus on risk of bias. And you may be asking, okay, bias, 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 remind me what that is. Well, let's assume that it's been a little while since you took a research methods course, okay? So here's a quick reminder. Bias is a systematic deviation of results or inferences from the truth. And that systematic is the key. But bias is not the same thing as imprecision. Imprecision is random deviation from the true measure of the finding. For instance, if I did the same exact study multiple times on different samples, I would find different results. You know, some measures would be higher, some would be lower. This is just imprecision, some wiggle or random variation around what the true population measure uh, would be. That's not the same thing as bias. Bias is a problem because we can have very precise measurements that systematically lie to us. And if you see here, all of these points are very close together, just like in an unbiased, this is unbiased, they're um, right in the center there, and they're precise. Biased estimates can be precise, but just missing the mark, and that difference there is the bias. So imprecision we can deal with statistically, and it's always present, always, always, at least to some degree. But you notice how the you know, measures on those bottom targets are all spread out? Okay, that is imprecision. And we can still have bias and imprecise, 
because look at here again you know we have points that are spread out we have very different measurements but they don't cluster around the center of what we're taking to be in this you know graphical analogy what the true measure is so what we need are tools that can help us identify study characteristics that lead specifically to bias now, what's nice is there has been a ton of research over the past decade and a half to identify what specific study character characteristics are associated with bias. So basically, we don't have to guess on this. Concretely, let's think of an example of a bias effect. Studies that have, you know, that what this would mean is studies that have a particular characteristic would tend to systematically overestimate or underestimate the true effect size. So for example, you know, randomized control trials, we know this from research, that randomized control trials that are not blinded also tend to have higher effect sizes than RCTs that are blinded. Now this gives us a pretty clear sense that failure to blind is associated with a systematic overestimation of effect or a systematic bias toward overestimation. Now I'm not going to talk in this you know, brief little intro about specific tools. So you can find all kinds of uh, tools out there and resources to support them. But I'm going to give you a sense of general tool components. And what do I mean by that? Just the general structure of what these uh, good tools look like. In general, tools will uh, target specific domains associated with risk of bias or internal validity. They will seek to estimate bias within each domain by asking a series of questions. So it's not usually it's not just one question per domain. It, you know it may be multiple. And in good tools, you'll often see a few questions for each domain. So how do these tools work? Well, graphically we can see. Let's say we've got three different domains here. Okay, one could be you know. Um, bias due to patient selection. Another one could be uh, measurement bias, etc. Um, so for each one of these, we may have a series of what are called signaling questions. And by answering each one of these questions, and I may answer differently depending on the article, you know, um, this will give me the basis for a judgment um, of what I think uh, about domain one in terms of its potential for bias. Now again, this is not automatic. Okay, these are all judgments and the whole idea is that by, you know, answering these questions I can make a more informed and transparent judgment about whether I think domain one or domain two or domain three, etc. are a problem. Here's an example from the U.S. Uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality that shows how signaling questions are embedded within domains. So on the left hand column you see here are different domains. So selection bias, performance bias, attrition bias, etc. And then there are criteria within each of the uh, the domains that are the signaling questions. These are going are the questions that are going to give you the basis for making a judgment about the overall um, bias within a domain. Now there are customized tools. Different study designs are susceptible to different avenues of bias. What this means is that one tool doesn't necessarily and probably shouldn't fit every research design. Okay. Um, specific domains differ based on study design. So tools that evaluate RCTs, randomized control trials, are going to be different than those that would be used, say, for cohort studies or diagnostic accuracy studies. In this lecture, I'm going to focus on, um, I'm going to, well, actually, I'm going to give you uh, some uh, particular tools that are often used to assess clinical trials, but then I'm also going to show you, give you some examples of ones that are for non-clinical trials as well. But as I said, there are other types um, of research designs. So for your project, whatever that is, you're going to want to find a risk of bias tool or tools sometimes that are appropriate to your question and study designs.
Now, what's nice about the AHRQ approach is that they clearly indicate which questions are appropriate for which kinds of designs. And you'll notice if you look down through, you know, where the X's are, that not every question is relevant for every design. Well, what are some principles of a good tool? Well, ARCAB uh, advocates using the following general principles when selecting a tool or approach to assessing risk of bias in a systematic review. So the tool should be specifically designed for systematic reviews, okay? Not designed for some other use. Um, they should have demonstrated validity and reliability. And very often, if you find a tool that you think might be good, you can search up um, research on it. Um, what is the iterator reliability? How easy is it to use? How does it compare to other tools, etc.? So you always want to check out the reliability and validity of the tool that you choose. Also, it you want to specific, the items should specifically relate to risk of bias or internal validity. Some tools will incorporate questions that deal with applicability. Those aren't bad, but don't confuse that with um, risk of bias or internal validity. And then when available, um, you want the tool to be specific to the particular study designs that you are evaluating. So if you're looking at or if you're answering a question with only RCTs, then probably the Cochrane ROB2 tool is all you'll need. But if you are incorporating you know, non-randomized trials or even uh, observational designs like cohort or case control, you may actually need to use more than one risk of bias tool. Finally, you want to avoid the presentation of risk of bias as a composite score, a number or a rating. Okay, um, the thing is not all risk of bias questions are created equal. There are some that are critical flaws. You could have an otherwise great article. It makes one critical or fatal flaw and boom, it is a high risk study. All right. So when you just create a, a score like what you see um, in that's like the Pedro score, which is often used in physical therapy literature, um, they don't differentiate. All um, risk of bias characteristics are the same. And so it kind of washes out the importance of some versus the others. We don't want to go that way. So what do you use? Because even narrowing down tools that meet the previous criteria, there are a lot of options. All right, which do you choose? So for this little talk here, I'm going to show you some of the mo more commonly, or just mention actually, some of the most commonly used tools for clinical trials and other types of design um, that are specifically used uh, or designed to be used in systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So for instance, for treatment or intervention questions with randomized clinical trials, Cochrane Risk of Bias tool um, and more recently, the ROB 2.0 um, really are the state of the art. That's what you want to use. If it's treatment or intervention questions that are non-randomized clinical designs, the Robbins Eye um, is a good tool to use and has re uh, received a fair amount of scrutiny. Now, for questions that are only where it uses only observational study designs, the Newcastle Ottawa scale or questions from the AHRQ methods document that I showed you earlier uh, for specific design types can be used. There's a lot of critique of the Newcastle Ottawa scale. Um, there's also a newer tool that really is, you know, is as you know, similar to. Um, the Cochrane ROB 2.0 or Robin's Eye, it's called Robin's E. Um, but um, it, it, the, there's really not consensus yet on uh, whether you know, the field thinks that this is the best tool to use or if it's uh, the best tool in the form it's currently in. So research is currently ongoing with that. Uh, for diagnostic accuracy questions, the Quadis 2 is really right now the state of the art. For environmental exposure questions, there are several different types of tools, but some recent research has indicated that the OHAT risk of bias tool uh, may be both more user friendly and less prone to being a bit harsh. 
um, and some comparative studies. So again, um, these are tools that um, personally I would um, sort of recommend and I have used. Uh, you know, but again, this isn't to say that it's necessarily going to fit yours. So you would, again, whatever you choose, do some background research on. Let's talk about the difference between overall confidence versus risk of bias. You know, once you have all the risk of bias questions for a particular study and you, you know, you still haven't made a determination of the overall confidence that you can have in this study, whether it's telling you something you can trust. And you might be thinking, wait, what? Well, think about it. We have to ask confidence in what, right? Studies usually have several outcomes they measure. They design studies to, you know, examine the primary outcomes. And sometimes this means that secondary outcomes aren't always as carefully measured. Let me give an example. I worked on a project where nutrition outcomes uh, in relation to exercise was our main outcome of interest. Here's what was interesting. When we examined exercise-focused articles, they did an amazing job of measuring exercise outcomes. I mean, really, you know, just rigorous, rigorous measurement techniques and approaches. But what was pretty amazing was their measurement of nutrition outcomes, um, you know, just really left a lot to be desired, okay? So what this told me is that while one set of outcomes I could have high confidence in, there were other outcomes from the same study that really raised a lot of questions. So even a study that has a cross domains low risk of bias may be woefully inadequate from the perspective of your particular outcome of interest. So we can kind of think of it this way. In general, if a study has many risk of bias issues, then we're going to have low confidence in the findings. If there are few risk of bias issues, then the amount of confidence we have really depends on the specific outcome. So we have to pay close attention to that. Now, key components of a risk of bias tool. Again, this is kind of a review. We have the questions, which are sometimes called criteria or signaling questions. We have the domains, which are general types or categories of bias. And then we have our overall confidence. Um, Often I see, you know, uh, studies will characterize it as, you know, high risk of bias, moderate or low, or high confidence, moderate or low confidence. Um, so, you know, you have those kind of three levels, if you will. Let me give an example from the Quadus II domain, uh, patient selection. You'll notice that there are three different signaling questions. Was there a consecutive or random sample of patients enrolled? Was a case study design um, a case control design avoided? Did the study avoid inappropriate exclusions? I would answer these three questions and then that would give me a sense of, well, what do I think overall for this domain about patient selection? Is it going to be a problem or not? Now, there's another common confusion uh, between risk of bias tools versus writing guidelines. And this is, this is pretty common. Standards for articles tell authors what components of the study should be reported in an article. This is a writing guideline. That's different than a risk of bias tool, which can help you evaluate whether there are problems in the study design or execution that decrease our confidence. And we don't want to confuse these two. So for instance, here's some reporting standards, which are dear reader or dear author, here's what all the components you should have in your article when you're writing up a good article versus risk of bias. So for instance, we have the starred criteria uh, in diagnostic accuracy. Here's how you write one of those articles up. And that is related to, but is different from the quadus two, which is the risk of bias. Same thing for consort, for um, clinical trials. Uh, that's paired with the Cochrane risk of B. Strobe, you, this is observational studies. You have the HRQ criteria. For Prisma, uh, you have Robus, and yeah, they even have writing guidelines and risk of bias tools for systematic review. So if you're writing a systematic review, get your hands on Prisma, get your hands on Robus, all right, so you can know these things ahead of time. So to sum up, risk of bias is not the same thing as quality. We value 
if we evaluate risk of bias by domain using a series of questions to help us make a decision. And then we use design-specific tools to help us evaluate the risk of bias.